dedicated to mapping EOC for this school year. And then we wanna begin the conversation about adopting the Laude system for student recognition, as opposed to the uh, valedictorian and salutatorian, uh, salutatorian um, um, format. Next slide, please. So many of you may be familiar with the West African uh, Maasai uh, tribe and the greeting, traditional greeting they have, and that is, and how are the children? And so the typical response is to be, and the children are well. And really what that means is that not only are the children well, but the community is well. But one of the things that we know in this uh, state of the pandemic is that our children are not well, and that's a problem. And what we, again, we see that our children are not read a well. Um, just about a month ago, there was an NPR story, um, a local NPR story about um, stress and depression among students. And several of our students were featured in this, but about one in four students right now, teenagers are struggling with depression and that's twice uh, as large as normal. So we know that in the region, our children are not well. How are our children in University City? Next slide, please. So uh, our high school team, uh, the uh, student support team at the high school had a chance to engage students as well. And I'm not gonna read these to you, but I'll just give you a minute to uh, read some of the feedback that our students provided us. So this gives us an indication of the state of our students. We understand that our students or um, some are well, many are not, and many of us are struggling. And so we believe that in order to support wellness, we believe in leading with our humanized pillar. And so we talk about this concept of Maslow, Maslow before bloom. And basically what that means is Take, uh, we take, uh, we prioritize the humane needs, the needs for uh, clothing, food, shelter, well being before we can focus on any kind of academic content. So Maslow always is before Bloom. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, Mr. Basie. Well, good evening, board members. Um, so uh, we wanted to share this slide with you, which is data from first semester. So um, approximately 45% of pre-K through six students uh, are choosing to learn, chose to learn at home in the first semester. Um, at, at that point in time, all students seven through 12 were learning at home. Um, that's going to change over the next week. Uh, this week, everybody was virtual, but next week, seventh and eighth grade will be returning to the middle school. Uh, but even with, the, with that, uh, those two grades coming in, um, about 50% of, of those students uh, chose to stay home. So we're still sitting around the 45 to 50% uh, margin of students who are choosing to stay home. So these are still, uh, people who are uh, un 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 feeling unsafe coming into school and still feel like the best place for their child is is in the home. So um, even with all the, the concern about connection, uh, we still have uh, parents and families who feel uh, like home is a safer place for them right now. Um, and so, you know, in light of that, uh, attendance, taking attendance is not something that's been... Um, very easy to do uh, this school year. We've tried to track some engagement statistics. Um, these are not super accurate, but um, uh, ClassLink allows us to see how many kids logged into ClassLink in December and are engaged in that process. So about 68 for students, 68 percent of the students in the district logged into ClassLink, and then in Google Classroom, uh, we have been pretty consistent with about 2,500 active users. That includes faculty, so it's not quite at 100 percent of our of our uh, uh, student population, uh, but we're close. So there's a lot of students who are using Google Classroom on a daily basis um, and have been consistently since the start of the school year. Um, so this is, this is the kind of rough data we have in terms of engagement.
And so uh, with assessment, uh, our approach has been to be, you know, safe, gradual, and kind. We're trying to make sure that students are safe in terms of COVID is concerned. We want to make sure that, that students feel like they have a place to, to be when they're, when they're there. Um, we want to make sure that this is gradual. We, we, we rolled out assessment very slowly this year in terms of uh, of when students are taking it and how often. Um, we didn't give a lot of the Galileo assessments to uh, kindergarten through fifth grade that we would have in the past, um, six through 12, uh, not everyone took every test. Um, we've been very um, flexible in our approach in terms of making sure that students have the ability to feel comfortable in, in the learning environment in which they are. Um, and, ki and kindness is a you know a final word here. Uh, we're just trying to be as thoughtful as we can be when, in terms of, uh, of of the student population and making sure that, that we're being nice to them and and um, and thinking of them and thinking of their their well-being uh, when we when we take a look at assessment. And so um, uh, this slide is the assessment calendar that that. Um, uh, we took to schools this year. Uh, it's slightly different than last year, but uh, you can see that, that we do Galileo, Fast Bridge, Reading Inventory. We have the Language Live assessments. The windows are here. They're trying to, we try to space it out um, and, and try to give some clarity around what we've, what we've done. Um, you can see that Fast Bridge, which was initially supposed to be a screener at the beginning of the year, we pushed back to late November, mid December because we were. Um, just trying to, to work around um, uh, some training on that and making sure that students were uh, in, a, in a comfortable and familiar place before they uh, uh, took that assessment. And I, and I just want to add one point here. Really, one of the main reasons we're sharing this slide is to say, yes, we do understand that we need to gauge our students' progress. However, given the realities of the world that we're living in, we do have to allow our kids, our teachers, and our families some grace. However, we still do have expectations that we will be able to determine how much a kid has master standards this year. Next slide, please. And so as you're aware, uh, there was no MAP or EOC testing in the 2019-2020 school year uh, due to the COVID coronavirus. Um, but the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has said that testing, MAP and EOC testing will take place in the spring of this school year. Uh, and their reasoning is on the next slide. I'm not going to go over all of this, uh, but they do want to uh, um, make sure that they are being consistent with uh, the laws that, that provide them uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act and making sure that they're there. Uh, what they are not doing is going to uh, calculate uh, assessment scores, achievement scores into the APR measures or the MSIP measures that they typically do every year. So uh, when we get our APR uh, MSIP reports uh, in, in the summer or the early fall of next year, uh, these scores will, will not be a part of that uh, again, so uh, we will not have uh, data on, well, we'll get data on how students did on the assessment, but it won't count for anything in terms of the state is concerned. So I'm about a, Dr. Buchanan take this slide. So about a month ago, Dr. Harden Bartley and myself met with a, a couple of officials from DESE to, to propose an alternative to assessment. And our first recommendation is that we actually forego the MAP and EOC exam for this school year. And here are the reasons why. First, we believe that this is an extremely inefficient use of instructional minutes. Uh, at the three through eight level specifically, assessments take between nine and 10 hours of instructional time. And that's just with the test itself. So that doesn't speak to the preparation needs to happen both before and after. And we just believe that the loss of instructional time due to COVID makes very little sense this year. Um, we also uh, suggest that the timeliness of assessments is one of the reasons that we shouldn't do it this year. For the most part, once we get the MAP test back, 
August, September, sometimes even later, there's not much we can do with dead, dead data. So why spend 10 hours of instructional time to give a test that has very little meaning for us? The next piece is alignment. The test is not accurately aligned with what Desi calls the blueprint. So what Desi says is going to be on the test is actually not on the test. Next thing is inequity. Through no fault of their own, many of our black, brown and students from low income families are not getting full access to instruction, especially the remote instruction. And so, especially a number of our students that get specialized supports are also not getting the supports that they need because of COVID limitations. And so we feel like this uh, gap has now become a chasm and we feel that uh, uh, giving a, uh, a lengthy map test is just adding insult to injury. And then the final thing is, I don't know if you've been in a home where there are four or five computers going on at the same time, but it makes bandwidth a challenge. And so when you think about three or four children trying to take the MAP test or the EOC at one time with limited bandwidth, you can best believe that we're gonna have some glitches. And it is very possible that a middle school brother might assist his fourth grade sister with a little problem or two. We never know. And so these are just some of the reasons why we are proposing an alternative. Next slide, please. And just three more points. We propose using a broad and comprehensive set of assessments versus one assessment. We believe that one shot assessments don't accurately tell the story of our students. And so we are um, arguing for a different approach. And then the other piece is that we want to continue to prioritize our personalized pillar. So we just want to keep providing students with um, personalized instruction in real time using real time data. And then the next piece is we just really want to have an intensive summer institute so we can try to mitigate some of the loss that's happened over the course of the year. And so the data we will share with you today uh, is the basically the data that we have from last year. So that includes advanced placement assessments, ACT, ACT work keys. And then we want to talk a little bit about our dual credit and dual enrollment program. Well, that isn't necessarily assessment. That does play into uh, what you are going to see here in terms of advanced placement. Next slide, please. So this is the AP five-year trend. Uh, so I update this every year with our AP scores. It's the percent of students with scores who were at three, who scored a three or higher on uh, the assessments that they took. So last year, 47% of our students who took an AP exam scored a three or higher. And, and you'll notice a couple of trends here. Missouri dropped uh, pretty drastically from 60, mid low 60s over the past four years to 50% last year. Uh, globally, the, the scores went up uh, 4%. So uh, a lot of, of differing uh, directions here with what's going on with everything. I'll also point out on this slide that uh, the 47% for us is also due to the fact that um, fewer students of ours actually took an AP exam. Uh, this year we had about, uh, or sorry, last year in 2020, we had about 50 or so students take an AP exam. Uh, or two or three. And in, in, in 2019, we were talking about 80 or 85 or 90 students taking an AP exam. So fewer students focusing on uh, an AP exam that, that they had a better chance of getting credit on. Uh, you know, colleges will take, uh, 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 most colleges, I should say, would take a college credit with a score of three. Some require, however, a four or a five. It's really difficult for our students to get uh, a credit college credit through the AP program, which is why we've changed our focus uh, over the past couple of years to the dual credit and dual enrollment uh, uh, pro program. Next slide, please. And that's here. Um, so I want to point out just the three, really the three bottom bullets here. Uh, 95 students uh, last year earned college credit in 258 courses. That's about $52,000 of savings to our students. Uh, that, you know, that's a roughly an average, you know, average, you know, multiply the 258 courses times the average cost of a college credit course or whatever. That's where I got that $52,000 from. And in addition to that, 19 students were in our early college program. That program exists where our students, our 19 students, go to 
uh, the community college, St. Louis Community College, and participate. They're there all day, and they take classes at the community college. Uh, they got credit in 105 courses, just those 19 kids, uh, for a savings of about $21,000. Uh, and they're guaranteed, as long as they pass the class, they're guaranteed that college credit. So uh, it's, a, it's a much better way for our kids to get uh, college credit. We have more students doing that than we have taking the AP test. So our focus has shifted from AP to dual credit and dual enrollment over the past few years. And we think that's a positive thing. And kudos to the high school for all of their work uh, in making this happen along with Susan Hill and others and Rebecca Soriano as well. I mean, if you wanna say it's been, a, it's been a real team effort around that, uh, uh, around that dual credit um, uh, push. So, so yeah, congratulations to everyone on that. And then uh, here are ACT composite scores over the last uh, four years. So I just wanted to point this out um, that we have pretty much uh, held steady, especially the last three years, 16.9, 16.8. So we're right there. Um, State of Missouri uh, had an increase from 2018 to 2019 and then kind of held steady this year. Uh, interestingly enough, the, the, the country scores have kind of dropped over time. A 21 back in 2017 and a 20.6 uh, in 2020. Uh, that's a lot of students taking that ACT test. And so to see that much of a drop, uh, it's fairly significant. And, and while, you know, the, the country has dropped, um, and even last year, the, you know, Missouri dropped a, a point, we've gone up. So going from uh, even, even, a, even a tenth of a point is a, is a big deal for us. So uh, let's, let's continue that trend. And the, the, the thing about the ACT, as many of us know, uh, many colleges now are de-emphasizing the importance of the ACT and the SAT test in terms of college admission. Next slide, please. And then we're going to turn it over to Susan Hill, who should be on this call, um, to talk about ACT work keys. Good evening, everyone. ACT Work Keys is an assessment that is from the ACT company, just like the College Readiness ACT. This test, um, as I've shared in uh, prior presentations, allows students to earn a career certificate at the bronze, silver, gold, or platinum level. Their career certificate then makes them eligible for career pathways, um, such as the Boeing Manufacturing Program, other manufacturing um, certificates at St. Louis Community College, the Building Union Diversity Program, patient care and other health sciences and lab technician programs that students can enter and also information systems programs, many of which are free um, and shorter training programs. They can be anywhere from as short as six weeks to 12 weeks to eight month programs, oftentimes that yield in very high placement rates in middle skill careers that then can lead to free college tuition reimbursement through their employers and then um, lead them into stair-stepping to higher skilled jobs and even more advanced degrees. So. We are now encouraging all seniors to take the ACT work keys. Um, in, um, even many of our uh, four-year bound students right after high school are wanting to take this assessment, especially our um, young people who are going into STEM careers because many of them want to take lab positions over the summer. And we are finding that there are some now um, STEM internship programs at the college level that are requiring the work keys assessment. And we have some recent graduates who have um, come back and shared their uh, need to take that work keys assessment. So we are now encouraging all students to take the work keys. Last year, we were able to get an assessment in during the school day before we went to virtual learning after spring break. And you'll see that we have really trended upward in our number of students earning certificates. In 2019, we did not um, test all of the seniors. We tested a large number of them. And you see a significant increase in the number of certificates earned because we also did a lot of individualized retesting for students so that they could then earn um, that certificate at the bronze and silver level. Uh, in 2020, we did test the entire senior class, but unfortunately we lost the, the luxury of having the students in person. And so the ease of retesting 
students and um, the fact that this is an in-person assessment, it is not an assessment that they can take at home, meant that um, we did increase our, our um, silver, gold, and platinum certificates. But I, I do believe that we would have had a significant number more even bronze certificates had it not been for um, the pandemic. I will say though, since this data has been um, presented, we are still in contact with our 2020 graduates and many of them have already scheduled um, through our adult ed and transition specialists, we are still bringing them in to retest um, with the work keys assessment and getting them then placed into um, middle skill career training program. So we're very proud of the progress we've made um, with ACT work keys. Um, this year is presenting a challenge with the work keys like last year because this is an in-person assessment. So we are very much personalizing for each one of our seniors the um, college and career assessments that they are taking. We will be testing some of our early graduates um, in the next couple of weeks. And then we also have seniors in career exploratory courses that will be taking the work keys assessment um, in the week prior to spring break. So looking forward, forward to um, continuing this upward trajectory and getting students um, into these career opportunities despite the challenges that the pandemic is presenting. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And so our last slide is really just reimagining how we recognize student achievement in our district. And as some of you may know, especially those of you who have had um, high, who have high school graduates or who have uh, children who are in high school now, uh, this Laude system can cause um, some stress. And so there are really four reasons that we are um, suggesting moving, moving to the Laude system. Uh, one is that it really aligns to our humanized pillar and our commitment to well-being. There's a lot of research that says that high achieving students tend to be uh, unnecessarily stressed to fight for these class rankings. And especially in light of the fact of the increasing number of kids that are experiencing clinical depression, we are recommending that we can reconsider uh, the model that we use. The other piece is that um, the Laude system does um, give colleges a different perspective on kids. So research shows that colleges may even consider graduates a little bit differently when class rank is not a factor. They tend to focus on other factors such as grades, rigor of the courses and extracurricular activities. Um, the other piece is that students are more thoughtful about course selection as opposed to uh, selecting a course because it has a higher weight. Students will likely choose courses, that might be a factor, but the other factor might be, it's just a class that I really enjoy. It's not about the grade, it's more about the learning. And I know that is a shift that both the high school and the middle school are consciously making right now to focus on learning rather than focusing on grades. And then the final piece is that we can recognize more students. Uh, we know that students need to be affirmed and supported. And so we can recognize with high honors more students if we decide to adopt this approach. And that actually is the last slide and we're more than happy, uh, myself and the CNI team are more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, were there any questions from the board at this time? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna jump in with a question. Um, it's nice to see, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, it's it's nice to see a lot of our data trending in the right direction in spite of all of these challenges. And I commend you for the work you're doing here. I'd like to revisit one of the early slides, the engagement statistics. Um, it looks like 65% of our students are engaged, but I, I but that's on the um, class link. Will you clarify whether that's the total number of student, students engaged or just those engaged with class link? This is the one I want um, to hear more about. Yeah, that would be just students who log in to class link. So they have to, the class link is our, you know, district resource hub. So they would have to log in to class link to get counted in this statistic. So um, it's 68% of all of our students because all of our students have access to class link. 
Um, but it's those, it's only those students who logged into ClassLink. So if they got, went to a website separately, or if they, um, you know, if they, if they went just straight to Google Classroom, they wouldn't be counted in here. Uh, they would have had to have logged into ClassLink to use a resource in that, in that system to, to, to be counted, if that makes sense. So it's probably underestimating the number of kids who are actually like engaged and active during the day. Um, so does that make sense? Uh, yeah, thank you. It's, it's that particular route of engagement. Correct. So do we have engagement levels for December? I mean, you know, ClassLink basically tells us who logged in and who didn't. Google Classroom tells us who's using Google Classroom. Um, you know, 2,450 active users. There's roughly 2,600 students in the district, plus a few hundred teachers. So, um, you know, you could take that percentage, uh, which is higher than the 68%, um, but this is, uh, you know, the problem is that, that measuring engagement, and I've reached out to other districts as well around this, uh, uh, around this problem, but measuring engagement virtually uh, to see, like you're just basically counting clicks on a, on a computer screen, it's very difficult to do. Um, and we don't have good, a real good statistic that gives us a really, really good indication of whether students are actually engaging in classroom content or not. Have you been able to drill down to the classroom level to see what percentage of students are engaging um, from the from the roster of each of each teacher? I know that's a, a really at the building, at the building, the building level. level, yes, and it varies by um, grade, it varies by um, building. And so I would say on average, district-wide, we have about 70% of our students that I would say are, at, are engaged. That engagement varies by being highly engaged, moderately engaged, or somewhat engaged. Then about 30% of our students were not touching. And that is um, more on an average district-wide. Again, there are some um, teachers who have higher levels of engagement, some buildings with higher level of engagement. One of the um, pieces that I'm going to be sharing with you later is our partnership with the national organization that is working with districts to look at this, um, this very topic. We, we must do a better job of, of monitoring and uh, measuring, but more importantly, we must do a better job of touching our students. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's, it's, um... It, it, it's just a, such a sinking feeling to know that we're we're missing so many of our kiddos. Yeah, I have a question for Ian. Ian, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Yeah. Listen, uh, is there any uh, additional information about the law the law system uh, that that we can you know maybe look up and read a little more about you know and really digest what it's all about. Yes, ma'am, we can absolutely share that with the board. Okay, um, is, it, is it something that you'll have to send us? Yes, ma'am, I will have to send it to you. Okay, would you do that for me, please? Absolutely, not a problem. Uh, all right, thank you. Were there any other questions or comments? And I guess my real quick question is: um, Is most do you see think that most of the um, non engagement is at the uh, the upper grades for um, virtual students? Yeah, I think that's accurate. Uh, you know, definitely the high schoolers are probably less engaged than early early, early childhood elementary students for sure. Okay. Do we know how this compares to um, what's happening in other districts and what's happening across the country? Not yet, because we're, everyone is still collecting data. We've only been in this environment for four months, five months. So that is something that I'm going to be sharing with the board, but we don't have um, a lot of uh, data. I will say that my colleagues are struggling with students who are virtual, um, struggling with students who are the most vulnerable across the board. And that's really any great age span, not just the high school level. That's from kindergarten through grade 12. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? 
Okay, item 1.2 reentry update. So um, this is something that I share with the board at our regular meetings and also work sessions. So I have a, a quick update. Um, it's not a lot of new information. Um, we do have some recent information that was just received this week after this deck was loaded. Um, we, we know now that the Pfizer vaccine is available for administering and we have three nurses that are in our system that will be taking that initial round. Um, the tentative date is January 15th. Um, the, the second scheduled um, vaccination has not been determined yet. So we are working closely with um, the health department as well as our nurses to understand um, the vaccine. There are also um, numerous conversations being had with uh, Spring Schmidt's office and local superintendents who serve on a um, task force or a focus group to look at reentry. And so we are looking at protocols for how um, the vaccine will be administered. Teachers, educators are considered phase 1B in the Missouri vaccination plan. Um, there are no direct mandates for taking the vaccine. Obviously, our parents have immunization exemptions and certainly our employees do. There is a lot of um, legal conversation around that fact um, because of the, um, the health pandemic. So we are engaging with uh, Tulip Keeney as well to understand what, um, if anything, needs to be changed with ADA legislation at the federal level around this new vaccine. So more information to come regarding that but we do have three um, school nurses that are committed to um, taking the first round of the vaccine and more information regarding that rollout will be shared as it is available. Next slide. Okay, Sharonica. Sharonica. Yes. When you uh, get that plan, that, that distribution plan, um, I don't know, I didn't see it in here, but when you get that plan in terms of the hierarchy and who's gonna be vaccine, uh, vaccinated when, you know, would you share that with us, please? Absolutely. And the Missouri plan is available. Um, that mm -hmm. plan came out probably about three weeks ago. So, um, Julie, if you can make a note to share the Missouri plan. And I did um, share it with the board in one of my communications because I shared it with staff. So mm -hmm. that is pretty much the plan that I'm referencing. OK, so is that the one we're going to use? The well, Missouri plan is that well, yeah, <laughs> we're taking to... guidance from the health department. I didn't even right. know that the vaccine was in hand. Um, mm -hmm. I was on a call yesterday and learned about that, and it mm -hmm. has already been administered to St. Charles area nurses. Okay, okay, so, as soon as I get information, I'll certainly share it with the board as well as our staff. All righty, thank you. No problem. So, Hi, everyone. Main... Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, George. Okay, I am terribly sorry. Um, I, I had assumed both for work and for this that simply uh, having Wi-Fi in Indiana would allow me to do what I need to do and it's just been more complicated than that. I think it's just the old system here. My dad had one, you know, at his house. Um, I do wanna say though about the vaccine and I speak only for myself here, but um, I understand, you know, vaccine resistance. I've been reading what all kinds of people say about all kinds of things, and somebody has to step up and start saying, you know what, you gotta take the vaccine. And it's gonna be employers, and I hope maybe it's gonna be school districts, because we require vaccinations for other things. And we're in a terrible, terrible situation right now with this pandemic, and the vaccine appears to be our only way out. And to, be bowing to irrational fears of something that is going to save this country from a calamity that if it continues for months and months and months and years and years, it, it's, it's unimaginable. And um, we have failed educationally if we have so many people who can't understand that you compare risk and benefit, and that whatever the risk may be, 
We've already, it's already been through safety trials with the FDA, whatever the risk may be, it's a tiny drop in the bucket compared to what the benefit is in saving lives from something that is killing, what, 4,000 people a day now. I mean, this is dead serious. Um, and, you know, I mean, personally, I've been sitting around, I'll take the vaccine tomorrow, you know? Um, and I just don't understand it, but I, and I may do it personally. I think that uh, DESE, I think that MSBA, the State Department of Health, whoever, we need to be seriously thinking about this vaccination as being a mandatory vaccination, just like polio and smallpox and TB and whatever else we require parents to have proof of vaccination to enroll their kids in school. And, and, and same for our staff. That's it. You're muted, Dr. Harden. I might want to take myself off mute. So thank you, George. Our goal for this evening is to, for this update, is to give you um, updated information regarding the metrics related to COVID and to share where we are with our goal of being safe, gradual, and kind. I want to preface um, this report by stating that um, there is, this is a very polarizing issue. Um, there are a lot of strong opinions on both sides. And as your superintendent, I am charged with giving you information um, to the best of my ability and based on the things that I have consistently used to drive recommendations, science, um, what we're seeing practically in the field, and of course, recommendations from healthcare experts who have experience with understanding and navigating a response to a healthcare crisis such as COVID-19. So these are the metrics that we historically use. Next slide, please. This is where we are as of Tuesday, um, January 5th, um, per um, 1,000 cases by our population group. Um, we look at our younger students to look at those school age children, and you will see that we are still seeing our um, school age children at a lower rate than um, our other uh, groups. And it looks like the on my slide, the numbers are a little bit off. I believe that it is accurate in board docs. Next slide. This is where the, um, the rolling average, we look at a rolling average, which is seven days. We also look at a 14 day average, which gives a more trend type of data. But if we look at our um, rolling average, the positivity rate has dropped. I believe the last time that I presented, we were in about 20% or more. We're at 16.6%. We are still um, seeing the impact of holiday and winter travel. And so those numbers are still being adjusted. But as of Tuesday, this is where we are, 16.6% um, positivity rate. The um, new cases for the St. Louis County area, um, we are seeing that number also um, at a, a point that is concerning. Um, we have talked with our healthcare providers regarding ICU beds. On average, we have about 470 new cases. It is down um, since, no, since December, since the last time I presented. So we are seeing that trend down. One thing that I wanna share is that, and this is something that um, I just wanna call out the the winter, the winter break, kind of over the holiday, whatever you celebrate and New Year is not represented in um, this data point. So we think that as of next Monday, when we get that report, um, and that date is actually, it should be from last Monday of this week, Monday the 5th, the 4th, I'm sorry, we will have more accurate information. Next slide. So on the 4th, the rolling average for new hospital admissions was 107. Um, and that is, again, something that the St. Louis Pandemic Task Force looks at on a consistent basis to monitor um, how we are responding. Next slide. So positivity rate for ages, um, school age children in youth city. Um, we're still where we were. We, we honestly have not moved much. Um, the, the shift has been that our 
10 to 14 year olds are now lower than our five to nine year olds. So this, the percentages are still under five for those, um, those age groups that are in our early grades and then those age groups that are more middle school age children. We're still seeing a higher rate for high school age children, but that rate is also um, declining a bit from prior um, weeks. Next slide. So this is the uh, positivity cases um, in the last 14 days. So U City has consistently been in the white, um, which is you know something that I think um, we can look at. We also know that we have to do more testing. So there is a testing um, event coming up on Saturday that we did send out via Peach Jar, and we are partnering with um, Mercy, WashU, and the CDC for their saliva study, which is a non-invasive rapid assessment for anyone who is positive and all of their contacts. So we're trying to find ways to get more access to testing so that um, our community can be informed. We know that a number of our families are um, frontline workers and they are not afforded the opportunity, for example, to be in their homes like we are. They are out in the field and out working. And so we, we have to be cognizant of that. And um, testing is one mitigating um, strategy that has been proven to, to be effective in, in working to mitigate and minimize the spread of COVID-19. Next slide. So as of January 7th, um, we had three staff quarantines and we have one active staff cases. None of these of course are related to being in buildings because we are technically virtual. Um, these were from winter break and did not relate to any type of school level occurrence. Our positivity rate is almost non-existent at 0.03%. This is what that breakdown looks like by level. And the cumulative is unchanged from 1210. Next slide. So um, we had, we've issued a survey and I wanna thank our principals. Many of them have gone above and beyond to call, reach out, to humanize um, the reach, to get information from their families so that we can determine what we um, wanna look like going forward. We did ask for um, families' interest in a four-day option if we decide to move in that direction when it is safe to do so. So this survey data reflects that information and you will see um, the breakdown here. Next slide. And the, the final thing that I'll say is um, we, we are really well connected in the healthcare field, also um, partnering with local districts. We meet, I meet weekly with regional superintendents, also meet with districts in, in the Kansas City area and as well as Columbia and even in the Blue Hill. And so there's no one size fits all. And every district is navigating this the best that, that we can. We do know if we think about the assessment report that was just shared, there are no more students that the virtual environment is just not working for. And so as we think about that responsibility that we have to being safe, gradual, and kind, the well-being um, academically, uh, physically, emotionally of our children is of the utmost importance. So um, this is the information that we have to date. And we, we are um, really looking at where our students are not demonstrating um, the transmission at, at levels that are alarming. We're also looking at districts who have been in person. Um, one of the large, the largest district in our area, um, St. Louis Public Schools is returning their um, middle school and high school students on Monday. We have yet to finalize a plan for our high school students. As you know, our middle school students, seventh and eighth graders are returning on Monday in a hybrid model. But I do feel that as we move forward and have those mitigating strategies in place, it's not, I don't wanna politicize or um, discuss the vaccine. That is a personal choice. And that is the message that we have conveyed. But the vaccine is something that, that can help. And it is again, a parent's choice, a, a employee's choice at this point to um, exercise that as a resource. I've shared publicly that I will be taking 
the vaccine. My mom has been a healthcare worker at Children's mm -hmm. Hospital for 46 years. She took her vaccine a week and a half ago, the first round of the Pfizer vaccine. So um, we feel that with all of those things that, that we are putting in place, um, continuing to monitor our safety protocols, wearing masks, which we're doing pre-K through 12, that in um, the very short order, we should be ready to begin those conversations about returning our earliest younger um, learners. We feel that that is in their best interest and we feel that it is in the best interest of this system. I can address any questions you have. Um, you said? Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, I, um, I wanna make two points and then I have a question. One is um, so far there are no vaccines that are approved for children under 16. So I just wanna make sure that's clear to everybody. And then second, I will also say I have been in the, I have been a test subject in the Moderna study. And I just to make sure everybody knows that I'm also trying to be a role model um, on Wednesday, next Wednesday, I will be unblinded. Um, so I don't know if I had the placebo or the vaccine. And if I did not get the vaccine, I will be getting the vaccine on next Wednesday. Um, so um, it's been, a, I, I I don't know, it, like it's been a historical kind of thing to be participating in and I am um, <clears throat> really glad I got the opportunity to do it. And I really hope it helps um, our community. So then the question is, I, I have not been able to ever drill down like to know like the testing data for our zip code or for our school district, like not, not the testing data that you presented here, but like how many tests are, um, how many uh, PCR tests have been administered? Um, are you getting that from a different location? We are not getting that, um, that drill down number. We have requested that from the County Health Department. The reason is people are using a plethora of different agencies for testing. There is not one central location. I do know that in um, communities that are similarly situated with the poverty rate that we have and the African-American population that we have nationally, there's an underrepresentation of people of color, particularly black people and people in poverty um, who are having access to testing, which is why our efforts have been to try to um, bring that resource to them with the saliva test. And if you recall early on in the summer, we were advocating for being a testing site um, of course, that didn't happen. So um, we have not gotten that specific data from the health department to date. Okay, I just wondered, because I, like I said, I couldn't find, like you can see on some of the reports, like areas of the county and their um, testing rates, but I couldn't find anything that was very specific to the district. So I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something. And um, the testing rates have leveled off over time where um, Central was testing probably the highest for a long time, um, Central area, but now, it seems like it's more even across the board of the county um, lately, but anyway. Okay, that's all. Are there any other questions or comments? I can't necessarily see everyone. Um, I do want to say to to Lisa's point, thank you for making the point about um, vaccinating um, children and that not being. Um, available yet because I was going to um, also make that point. And I think it is best um, that uh, we aren't politicizing and that choice is available um, and that we are humanizing just because I think that we do need to be sensitive to, you know, to Georgia's point to the history um, that may be different for, um, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color and how they feel about, you um, you know, what's going on. I think it's best um, that we have people who are willing to and able to model um, and, you know, let the science play out. A lot of people may not be able to get the vaccine right away. And I think as we, um, you know, as more people get it and more people become comfortable with it, um, you know, I think people may begin to make those choices for themselves. And I think that at this point, um, I'm glad to hear that that's what we're doing, um, but that we're also, uh, we have people who are able and willing to model. That's it. Does anyone else have any other questions? Sorry. Um, okay, we can move on to item uh, 1.3, um, EAB contract and resources. So um, this is 
something that we are excited to be able to partner uh, around. It is EAB is a um, actually a global educational hub that really does research and supports um, districts with with strategy around curriculum assessment, um, instruction, child social emotional well being, um, finances, equity. So it's a, a plethora of resources. Um, I use this information at a prior presentation early on when um, we were looking at what countries were doing, other countries were doing around COVID-19 because we did not have any um, US-based schools that had been in session. So I'm very excited that as a result of our Wyman partnership, um, we are able to join this consortium of um, districts as well as to join this research um, strategy. They will be able to help us answer some of these questions that we were discussing today to see what other districts are doing around um, engagement. How were they addressing the tremendous learning loss that we know our students are going to experience? How are we designing like a summer learning academy that is much more innovative and thought provoking? How are we um, looking at those um, racial equity and anti-racist practices, approaches that are being put in place in districts. So um, this is not necessarily for approval because um, it is something that will be funded completely by Wyman, but we are excited to join this partnership. Districts, large systems um, are part of this, um, mostly um, in our area, Parkway. Uh, Keith Marty is a colleague that I highly respect. Um, he originally introduced EAB to me about two years ago and we didn't have the funding to take to, um, to join this, this effort, nor did I feel like we had the need, but with so many unknowns and so much happening with COVID-19, um, I feel that it is important for us to be well-researched and to have that information at our fingertips. So I'm excited and I just want to share this with you. Are there any questions? Lisa? I think you partially answered it because when I was reading through it, I was wondering how it was, you know, because we have a lot of um, leadership um, opportunities through different things. And we've got Shiraki Holly and, you know, all these other pieces. And I wondered how this integrated with integrated with it. And now I know we're not paying for it, too. So I was concerned about whether it was duplication of services. <laughs> so um, I don't know if you want to speak any more to, to that or not, but I, I was wondering about that when I was reading about it. Yeah, so it's really, it's a, it's a research hub. So if we have a problem of practice that we want to investigate, um, we will share that with EAB. We will have a team that partners with the district on a, a wide variety of efforts. Um, Joe Miller actually worked with EAB in Normandy because Normandy did partner with them. And so um, it's not a program. It's not you know something that they're coming in to do. It is really an arm that will help us do that sophisticated um, research fact finding to help inform our decision, our decision making. Also help to see where we need to change. Where do we need to make improvements? Where is our strategy not effective? So um, I think of it as like a think tank of over 6,000 school districts across the globe that we have access to now. Um, we have access to all of their databases for various topics. I just named a few, but there are so many that we have already tapped into. So um, not a duplication, not, you know, working with providing programming. It's more about that back-end support. Are there any other questions from the board? All right, thank you. Okay, so the next item I'm also excited to share. We have talked a lot about um, racial equity and I'm very happy to see that at PLUS, um, we have had several work groups with a small group of superintendents and we were working to figure out a way. We've been meeting every week. Um, we see each other on Zoom and honestly, we've been more engaged than we ever have as a team. And so equity is something that impacts all of us, regardless if we're in a majority white space, if we're in a majority black space, if we're in an affluent space, if we're in a poverty, high poverty space. It is a conversation that is for all of us. And so um, Ed Plus in tandem with uh, school districts, there are about 30 districts from across the area 
um, wide ranging demographics, wide ranging um, locations, and we will be engaged in this learning work. And I just wanted to make the board aware. I know that Ed Plus has been a partner. I sometimes question um, the value add that they bring other than procurement. Um, that's a personal, but I feel like this is something that is very value add. And I have seen under um, Paul Ziegler's leadership, I've seen a push for collaboration, a push for valuing what we have that is in common and not focusing on all of our differences. So um, the book is very provocative. Um, it's something that I think will um, really help to push us forward and help us have conversations about what we can do as regional leaders and not just so much in our silo districts, but how do we partner across districts and, and work with the needs of our students so that we can truly say that all of our children are well. Are there any questions? Joanne? I just have a comment. Yeah, I, I just wanna say that I'm really happy to see the superintendents working together so closely. Um, I know you're in a unique position and, and that those are your peers and that each of you is a single peer in your position in your district. And to see you working together and learning from each other and supporting each other, I think is it's it's really a wonderful thing for our region and it's a wonderful thing for all of our kids. So I'm very happy to see this. Thanks for letting us know about it. Absolutely. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Um, item 1.5, McNair uh, property uh, surplus or transition. Good evening. Uh, tonight I will be presenting some information on the McNair sale and a plan for transition. Uh, as always, we begin with the vision. Next slide. And the mission. Next slide. Our objective tonight is to summarize the conditions of the McNair sale and the phase moving plan. Next slide. Just some key points about the McNair sale contract that has been presented to the to the school district is that the sale amount of is uh, definitely above market value of the property. Uh, consists of some initial earnest money along with a secondary wave of earnest money that will come prior to closing. There's approximately a 45 day due diligence period, which will then be immediately followed by a 21 day moving period. A uh, key point is that effective on the closing date. We, will, we, the school district, would begin leasing the Lieberman Learning Center portion and the adult education portion of the building and remain in the building until September 1st of 2021. We will not be paying rent for this lease. However, we will continue to pay a portion of utilities and maintain the proper insurance coverage. Next slide, please. So upon closing, uh, what would happen would be that the uh, Admin would move to the AEL portion of the building, which is at the uh, southern end of the existing building. Uh, Lieberman Learning Center and AEL will function within the Lieberman Learning Center space. We would then acquire and modify a building that we're, that's being currently being pursued, which would house admin and a portion of the Lieberman Learning Center. We would modify existing space at the high school to accommodate another portion of Lieberman Learning Center and the AEL program. We would relocate the food service administration to the high school and the operations department would be relocated to Brittany Woods. Next slide, please. The next phase that follows this would be what happens after September. Um, so after September, the central office administration, less operations and food service, would, would depart from McNair and be housed at a building that we're, that we're pursuing for purchase. Lieberman Learning Center will, will split into two different components. The first component is our safety net and academic recovery program. It will maintain the McNair space, or it will vacate the McNair space and then be housed in a designated section within University City High School. The other portion of Lieberman Learning Center, which is our long-term intervention support program, would vacate McNair and be housed at the building that we are pursuing that will be uh, housing the central office administration. And an AEL would vacate McNair and be housed at University City High School as well. Next slide, please. Uh, just a few points about the Lieberman Learning Center. 
So as I, as I spoke to the, the different components, so the safety net and academic recovery program will be housed at University City High School and includes approximately 80% of the Lieberman Learning Center population. Some, some key points uh, to this would be that they would maintain a separate entrance and exit uh, for the Lieberman Learning Center students versus the, the rest of the University City High School population. They would maintain a small cluster of classrooms dedicated to Lieberman Learning Center students, would utilize one flexible office space, as well as uh, having access to a lot of community space in the high school for other programmatic needs. And of course, some dedicated restrooms to accommodate the program. In terms of the long-term intervention support program, it would be housed off campus in the building that, that the district is pursuing purchase and would include approximately 20% of the Lieberman Learning Center's population. Uh, this would consist of a large flexible learning space, classroom space for small group instruction, as well as flexible office space. Next slide, please. Uh, just to touch briefly upon the building that is being pursued for purchase, uh, the space includes dedicated office space for all central office departments, excluding operations and food service, a boardroom and also flexible space that could be used for meetings and PD. Uh, the space designated for Lieberman Learning Center is a flexible, flexible space that can also be utilized by both Lieberman Learning Center and central office as needed. And there's also uh, parking on both the east and the west side of the building. Next slide. At this time, I'll take any questions you may have. Julian? Uh, yes, will you um, again go over the scenario of what would happen if we um, accepted the McNair sale and did not acquire a new property? Yes, um, if we did not acquire new property, we do have enough space within University City High School that we could move Central Office Administration, Lieberman Learning Center and Adult Education and Literacy into the high school. It would require some, some modification, you know, obviously some modifications in order to accommodate all three entities, but it can be done. Thank you. Yes, Carl. Yes. Uh, the map that you provided uh, in the previous slide, uh, there are some places and offices and things that are labeled. Are those labels for us? Are this, I mean, are those our labels? That is correct, yes. It's, oh, it, okay. yeah, it, it speaks to, the end of it, it speaks to the um, positions that would occupy those spaces, basically. Okay, well, would you do me a favor because I am unable to read that. So I'm going to need a map that's a little bigger than that with the printing that's a little bigger than that. I just can't, I can't read it. I can't tell anything by looking at it. I can see the lines, but that's about it. So is it any way possible we could get a larger copy, a copy with larger print? Yes, we can, we can make that available. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions, Lisa? Uh, well, we have uh, a little bit more in-depth um, uh, presentation at some point about Lieber and Le like the the changes and staffing and um, uh, kind of like the way the programs work for Lieber Learning Center at some point. Um, just because I got a couple of concerns and I want to save them for the right appro appropriate time. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, along the line of what Lisa was asking, are we also going to get a little more detail about what exactly the high school is going to look at, like how that's going to fit in? Because um, I know because I don't think there's, you know, we've talked about like what spaces would be modified or what that would look like. Yes, so uh, there's been some pre preliminary discussions with Mr. Peoples at the high school and the high school team. Obviously, you know, as this uh, comes to fruition, we will drill down much further and be more explicit as to 
what is going to happen where and how. And um, I don't know about this question. So if you can't answer it right here and now, that's okay. Um, but I think it was to Joanne's um, question of um, if we um, are unable to acquire the property, um, but are not necessarily interested in putting everything in the high school, is there a provision for that as well? There's not a present uh, provision for it, but obviously it can be pursued. I, I would uh, look at it this way, that we are always keeping our eyes open throughout this process of any property that may become available that would suit our needs. And, you know, we've, we could obviously, you know, would be willing to look at, at anything else if, if, for instance, we were not able to acquire the building that we're pursuing. And yet we didn't necessarily want to move everything into the high school, you know, obviously we can continue to review the market and what's available. And, and, I, ask that just, and I just asked that because I know that you know, we have a, we have vaccines that are coming and they're becoming available. Um, and I know people are excited to get back to some type of norm, normalcy, but I think, um, you know, COVID had taught us, you know, that having that extra space um, has, you know, been, been valuable. And I, I think also, um, you know, the word asset has also been thrown around. And so, you know, I just, you know, as we're moving towards this, I'm, I still um, will always have, you know, in the back of my head that, um, you know, as we're even giving people, you know, people are being vaccinated, they're way further behind than they thought they were going to be. You know, they thought that they were going to have like 20 million people vaccinated by the end of December and they're not there yet. And so I just kind of keeping those things um, at the forefront because I just, I don't feel like um, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be that simple getting to the end of this pandemic. Those are just concerns that I have personally. Um. Excuse me. With the um, LLC students, that portion, uh, the majority of them being um, moved to the high school, are we contemplating that although they're going to be kind of in a separate segregated um, space, that they will have more opportunity to participate in the life of the high school, i.e. athletics, um, drama, other things, social, prom, all of that? I mean, these students are not the ones who are being put in LLC because of severe disciplinary issues. And um, I just wondered by proximity, it might be something that would help them have opportunities that would be a little more like, you know, normal high school. So now um, students that are not, um, do not have a type one violation are eligible to participate in all of the extracurricular activities at the high school. Um, those students who are at LLC for credit recovery purposes. So that would continue. The proximity would allow us to look at um, staffing and even um, course offerings for some of those students that could potentially expand that as well. So we're still finalizing that plan. And um, our goal would be at a work session and it's in February that we will be able to lay out what that plan looks like for the programmatic component of LLC. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I have one more. Um, would this also give our LLC students access to bus services? Yes, actually, uh, University City High School is along a bus route, which is on, along Hanley Road. And then the building that we are currently pursuing is also on a major bus route as well. So there would be bus service available to either side. Would LLC students use district transportation? They currently do not. And, and can we, is, I'd like to talk about that. Is, is this the forum to talk about it or in February? I'd like to know what the rationale is and if we can look into changing that. Yes. Yes, we, okay. we can discuss it further. Okay, let's, where we having, did you say we're discussing LLC in February? It's on the agenda? I will, yes. Okay, I'd like to talk about that then. Okay, thanks. And Joanne, just for clarification, you were asking, um, were you asking both that they're using 
um, the transportation now or if being in the high school would make it available for them to use um, district transportation? Um, I'm asking if, if them being housed in the high school would allow them access to district transportation, but I think wherever they are, I'd like to talk about why we're not doing that and you know why that decision was made long ago in the past and, and if there are some other alternatives that we need to look at to give our kids access um, to school because I know that's an obstacle for some of our kiddos. Is that yeah, I, I agree, Joanne, I agree. Yeah, this is this has just always been that way. I don't know if anyone knows when or why this was decision was made. So I'd like to take it up as as a group. Absolutely. Anyone else? Okay, uh, we can move on to um, item one point six: new or revised policies. Okay, um, this all three of these policies originated from the um, from the uh, policy committee. So I will go through them. Um, I'm actually going to start with uh, BDDG and go to the E one because those are easy, um, quick ones. Um, BDDG was. Uh, uh, Julie asked us to look at this because it had kind of some antiquated words in it, including separate minute book, which um, doesn't really um, reflect electronic files at this point. So it's just a very quick change to file from minute book to file. So um, we'll still keep the same records. It's just, it'll be electronic at this point. Um, are there any questions about that? Okay, and then the second one is also just a quick update. Um, <clears throat> when we were look, reviewing the e-policies, we found kind of a, a quote, a, there, if you look at the very bottom of it, it says by July 1st, 2001, um, the superintendent will designate a school safety coordinator. That made it feel like to us, it made it sound as if we have not been reviewing our policies because that date is so outdated. So we just wanted to change it to simply the superintendent will designate school safety coordinator. Um, and that's all that is. Any questions about that? Okay, and then the big one is a brand new policy that uh, the policy committee worked on. Um, it is policy AC ACJ, Educational Equity. I hope you all have had a chance to read it. Um, this is the first board reading of it. Um, we have the process we went through, <clears throat> just so you know, is that we did get a, um, a first draft that came from Maplewood Richmond Heights. We did a lot of work um, modifying it, um, trying to streamline it, clean it up and um, make it more specific to us. We've had legal look at it and MSBA also look at it at this point. So it's been through all those processes at this point. Um, and we now bring it to you all so that if you have any additional feedback, we can start the process over basically, not over, but you know, do the revisions and go through legal, et cetera, et cetera, since it's a brand new policy. Um, anything from anybody about it? I don't see anybody, um, any comments? We're very, yeah? Yeah, and very timely and um, very well done. Thank you for your work on this. Yeah, we're, we're excited about it. And I think it fits very well um, with, uh, and I, I also failed to say that Dr. Harden Bartley also went through it with us. I'm sorry, Dr. Harden Bartley. I just wanna make sure everybody knew she was on board and she went through this also. Um, but uh, yeah, we're really excited about this. I think it, it fits with, um, our direction as a district. And um, it's not a hard one to do because I think we're already following most of this. Um, we may have to be a little bit more mindful maybe with a few reports, but um, other than that, I think we're right on track. So, okay, no other comments? Great, thank you. All right, thank you um, for all your work with that. And we can move with to item 2.1, uh, the legislative letter. Okay. 
Was that like George? Was that you? Both George and myself. I'm the one who stuck the MSBA bulletin and the uh, still separate, still unequal report in it. And so, um, and I know George has some ideas too about the. So today, tonight, we just want to get ideas on what direction um, the board might want to go in um, on the legislative um, letter. Um, so, I mean, I have some ideas, I can share them with you. You can naysay or you can say, yeah, you know, like, no, don't want to go that direction or yes, I want to go that direction. Um, but a couple of things after reading uh, Still Separate, Still Unequal um, was maybe fo focus again on the foundation formula and um, talk about possibly some modifications to the foundation formula that may make things more equitable. Um, and then also talking about um, maybe some other uh, other taxes that I know are on the agenda that we would support, like the fuel tax, because that would take um, pressure off of the of the um, overall budget and possibly help us with the education but but um, budget. But start with the foundation formula. Maybe um, making a statement about how. Um, Missouri is very low on state funding with education and that we would like to see that continue to expand um, because of the inequities that are inherent in personal property tax funding education. Um, I also um, would suggest possibly changing the, found, the, the formula so that it is no longer based on attendance and maybe it's in based on quarterly enrollment or something like that, because that also uh, creates equity issues. Um, and then a little bit more of a controversial one for us prob probably would be to phase out, to consider phasing out the hold, hold harmless, which would actually not benefit our district at this point. Um, I did get numbers on that prior to, um, prior to this meeting. Um, and we do get quite a bit of, I, I, I should look up my numbers, but it was like, um, we get over $2,000 from hold harmless per student. So, um, so that would be more controversial for us, but it would provide equity for more districts. So um, those were some ideas with the foundation formula. And then of course, always pushing to have um, early childhood. I would say for all those people who want to see a better education for our children, I, I would them that um, the research shows that early child has more input, impact than um, charter schools. So, and to continue to push that direction. Those are ideas. So I'm putting it out there. Discussion. I wish you would have written them. I wish I would have written these down because there was a few that I, I wish, you know, specifically that you said that I wanted to go back to and now you can't remember them. Christina, um, I got them. Do you want me to uh, read them real quick? Uh, yes. Yes, okay. please. Uh, focus on the foundation formula, um, possibly change the formula to have it not based on attendance, but on enrollment. Phase out whole harmless would provide equity for their districts and early childhood education. Okay, yes, um, thank you. Uh, definitely yes to the um, childhood. I'm a little hesitant on hold harmless. Uh, definitely looking at changes in the formula, the foundation formula. Um, when you were talking about um, the gas tax, I do know that um, Missouri does have a relatively low gas tax. And I still feel like a gas tax is relatively regressive because I still feel like um, eventually that hurts people who, you know, have less in their pockets anyway. Um, so I'm kind of um, on the fence about that. The, just the gas tax in general, but definitely um, looking at, um, the foundation formula and how schools are funded. And the, I liked uh, the idea about the, um, the semester um, enrollment versus um, the daily attendance too. I think that was a very um, good thing to, to add and to have. And I think also goes to, towards equity, especially now um, during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Joanne, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I've got a, a couple. Um, yes, definitely, you know, early childhood education, that's the, the most important thing we can do for our kids. If we can, you know, find a way to get universal pre-kindergarten, 
Um, I, I think we can advocate for it. I don't know that the structure is there to support it. Um, I'm working with some people on some ideas, but we are um, still in the still still working on it. Um, and then the fact that Missouri is 49th in state funding for education, I think, is is really shameful. Um, and I, I think I think that we can point that out. And a gas tax that would go toward transportation costs, and then have the rest of the money move into funding districts as a potential route for raising more money. Um, you know that because we are there's so little money where we've got sort of this scarcity mentality, and if there was enough to go around, you know we wouldn't have to. I, there'd be more equity, more chances for equity. Um, I, I just want to bring up the only reason I brought up the gas tax is because it is on the agenda for um, this session. It's been brought up again. We do have, I think, we have either the lowest or second to lowest tax on gasoline in the in the whole country. Um, we're often underfunded for our highways. We are actually taking bonds out right now in the state to cover highway projects so that we could get federal matching funds. So we're not real functional right now with our um, highway, you know, like our, our roads funds. But that yeah. was that's the reason I brought it up, just because I know it's going to be on the agenda. And that money would have to go for more than school transportation based on. Oh, it doesn't go to, I'm sorry, I, I didn't, I didn't mean to make that confusing. The gas tax would go towards highway and roads, but it would take that money out of the, like it would, right now, some of that money's coming from general revenue to cover it, you know, so it would, it would shift the funds. Is there, um, I'm sorry, is there any rumbling of the um, cigarette tax again or the tobacco tax? Mm -mm. No, that one's not rumbling. Mm -mm. No, it was just the gas tax. Um, okay, so early childhood, the enrollment idea you guys like so far, um, like expanding the foundation formula to and the en en enrollment for better equity um, funding. Um, George? Yeah, I mean, this goes along with just general um, spending, obviously, and better revenues for education. Um, but I don't know if any of you were at this session at some MSBA event I went to a few years ago. I saw something very um, impressive, but in a bad way, about teacher pay and where Missouri stands on teacher pay. And uh, in some states, apparently, you know, it's kind of a statewide thing. And I remember we heard about, you know, teachers on strike across the state of Kentucky, I think it was, or West Virginia, somewhere. And it was apparent to me that, like, hey, they're really not, like, separately negotiating each district there. Maybe the legislature is deciding, here's the teacher pay scale. And I'm not trying to propose that. What I am just throwing out there is, do we want to throw in a sentence or two, um, maybe with some statistics, because... This presenter just showed it in a pretty shameful light. I don't remember, I don't think we were like last in the nation, but I think it was comparing to our neighbor districts, I mean, neighbor states, um, we did not look good. And, and that, um, you know, it's a problem. I mean, many teachers, of course, will be like, okay, they, they're born, raised in St. Louis, they're gonna stay here, they live here, they're gonna find a job here, you know, teacher pay may be a little more, a little less in one district or the other, and, and, and we try to do our best to stay competitive. But um, uh, there are gonna be those teachers, especially perhaps young, you know, new graduates who are gonna be looking around. Well, do I wanna, you know, do I wanna go live in Illinois? Do I wanna go live in Iowa? Do I wanna go live in Kansas? Um, and from what I recall of this presentation, those comparisons did not make us as overall statewide Missouri look very good. Um, that's true. That was a big, that was an MSBA presentation. I, I was there too. I don't you remember. There, yeah. You, did, did I, did you uh, agree with kind of what I remembered of it? Yeah, I, I do think that the rural areas are the ones that really, uh, the rural areas very much suffer from that in Missouri. Um, you know, the, within the um, still separate, still unequal, it did talk about the pay 
you know, the pay range for teachers in different districts. And there was a disparity there also, but they also considered a confounding factor that um, a lot of first year students or first year first year students, first year teachers um, and younger teachers are teaching in those districts also. So I don't know. I don't know if I have enough knowledge to really do that one, but I can look it up, I suppose. Yeah. Joanne. Yeah, yeah. The research will will bear this out too. That um, based on the number of years that people um, spend becoming educators, you know, they're they're in their level of degrees, level of educational attainment, and experience. When you compare teacher salaries for those levels of education attainment and experience to people in other careers with those same kinds of credentials and years, there's a really big gap between what teachers are paid and what other people are paid for the same amount of experience and education. Um, and there's, there's a growing teacher shortage. And so that's really a factor, a much long-term, more long-term factor potentially in getting people to go into and stay in education. Um, I mean, you know, I, a lot of my friends are teachers and I know a lot of you have the same situation too, but I've seen many teachers have to leave, leave the, the the field because they didn't, they weren't making enough money um, and their credentials immediately got them a pay bump of 20 or $30,000 in a completely different field. So it's, it's a systemic, um, but higher teacher pay may help with teacher retention and recruitment. Okay. I can, I can look at some of that. So sure. Okay. Laverne, you have any insight into this? I didn't, I can't see some people right now. I had a quick, uh, Matt? comment yeah um you know i think with our legislative letter we should probably focus on what's coming up in the general session um specifically the gas tax because it should be higher um but the one the one thing that um is I'm, I'm a little hesitant on about that is trusting our um state legislature to focus those released or those available funds from possibly more money into the highways and roads to education versus some, you know, who knows, like a tax cut or something. Um, that would be my one concern. I mean, obviously, I think we should, we should focus on that because without the tax increase, there is no availability at all. Um, but I think that might be a bridge we can cross at a later time. Um, so that and then maybe a long term play that we could maybe add to the legislator is, is speaking about the lack of funds that we have in the formula. Um, because again, 49th in the, in the, in the country is ridiculous. Um, so, you know, we, I, again, that's probably a, a longer play with, um, with more districts and, and whatnot. So that's my two cents on that. As we look at, as we look at these issues from a real practical, I guess, you know, state politics standpoint, anything that, um, can be made to look like it's actually a common need across all types of districts, including the smaller town and rural, that's a winner. And I don't know, you know, if our district looks at, for example, transportation as, gee, we got a real problem, but I know that it's a problem in, in rural districts. So, you know, maybe to put in a sentence or so, uh, about transportation funding specifically just is one of those things that, you know, helps build um, common cause across um, very different areas of the state, very different districts. Well, and I would add, Christine, to your point, you know, better roads and, and, and better highways equal longer, longer life on vehicles. So, so for people that don't have the money for repairs, um, you know, I've hit many a pothole in this town and um, luckily enough, I had the funds to repair those things, but I know a lot of people don't. And that can be the difference between a job um, and not having a job if they can't make it. So, um, you know, I think it benefits everybody, especially in the terms of just general maintenance on vehicles. Tracy, did you have any comments? Um, no, not anything more than what I'm hearing here. Everything is I'm still absorbing a little bit, but I think um, all the points that have been made, I kind of leave it up to everyone and 
So you, you don't have any specific causes that you would like to like bring up or you, and you have no objections to what's been brought up. I think that sounds a little wishy-washy right now, I'm sure. But um, <clears throat> I mean, the big thing for me, of course, is I definitely think teachers pay is like a huge thing um, and the disparity there. Um, so that that's probably one of my main concerns. And I know that that's something brought up and then early childhood. Okay, all right. So going forward, try to craft a letter and then get feedback from you again, from you guys. Is that co cool? At least I'll work with you as before on okay. that. Um, we'll do a shared Google Doc, George. Okay, do you need thanks. my notes at all to forward to you too? I took some notes and some of okay. it. Right. And Julie, right. Julie sounded like she had some. Um, I'll, I'll forward them, you guys use them or not, or however. That's great. And George, if you have a chance to, I don't know if you can remember the presentation, if you can kind of do a little research, maybe it's in a MSBA archive somewhere. <laughs> do, you think, do you think that was at an annual conference or was it one of these other? Um... No, I'm pretty sure it was at the conference. I'm pretty sure I remember it. And um, I think it was maybe the conference, obviously the conference prior to this one, mm -hmm. I think. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I've been around a long time, so I could be really distorting the date. Yeah, just, and, and, and on our Google Doc, if you want to, anything you want to throw at me um, and put my name on it or whatever, and I'll, I'll, I'll work with you on that. Right now, um, this might be a good time for me to work on stuff. Um, the last couple of days have just been nuts. My sister went into surgery at, uh, you know, well, we had to be at the hospital at 6.30 a.m. today. But um, I've been hanging out at my parents' house for indefinite amount of time till she gets um you know semi recovered so okay all right thank you that that's all i have right now okay i need to switch screens really fast uh we'll move on to citizen comments item 3.1 uh, your Board of Education is very interested in citizen input and concerns and has allotted a period of 30 minutes at the end of our board work session for citizens and staff to address us. We ask that remarks be limited to four minutes and that you please speak to issues. The board cannot discuss personnel matters or individual student concerns in public sessions. Citizens who wish to comment about a particular agenda item may do so during the citizen comment section. No comments will be taken from citizens during the regular board meeting or work session. Attendees wishing to participate in the citizen comment section of the meeting must sign up in advance prior to the meeting with their name, address, email, phone number, and topic of the comment. Comments will be read during the comment part of the meeting. It is our intent to conduct our meeting in a manner that is, that is at all times respectful to our students, staff, community members, and fellow board members. Julie, are there any uh, citizen comments tonight? Uh, we have two comments tonight. Let me get ready here. First comment, um, the topic is in-person classes and the first one is from Christine Phillips. Dear members of the board of the University City Board, what a task you have on your hands. You are responsible for making decisions that weigh the safety of our students, their families and our community with the educational future of our children, which of course aligns with their long-term success. I fully recognize that this is not easy work. I personally am in quite a juxtaposition position. I work at a private school for students starting at age three, going all the way through high school. Whether we wanted to or not, staff were told to return to campus in August. This left many teachers completely stricken with fear and angst that was clearly understandable given the circumstances. But there we stood in August, all our staff together, with the exception of a few who left, prepared to begin teaching in just a few weeks. Here we are now with our first semester completed and a total COVID count of 17, most of whom were staff with no transmission. Each day of work, I watch our students learn in person, knowing full well that the education they are receiving is superior to that of the students in our district, only adding to the economic and educational disparity that already exists in the city and across our country. This is not because the education in University City is subpar. In fact, it's the complete opposite. 
It's an educational system filled with exceptional educators and leaders, a place I am proud to send my children. But as an educator, I can say quite confidently that children are not meant to learn in front of screens. With half a year in front of a screen, plenty of data to show that schools that are open are actually more safe for families and children, and a large percentage of families who are already at, to begin full-time in person, it is past time to begin the process of opening school. Listen to the needs of all your families and children who are crying out for help. Each day at home, I watch my own two children try to engage in the learning in front of them. My daughter is a third grade student at Flint Park and her son is a first grader this year. The daily struggles of an at-home learning are immeasurable for my children. I watch my son crawl under the table multiple times a day to avoid his teacher and lesson. I pop in to find what he is, to find that he is, his screen is off and is engaged in an activity completely unrelated to school. I witness daily outbursts and tantrums from the feelings of failure and I'm currently in communication with our pediatrician as we begin to seek help to navigate these difficult behaviors. Should these struggles continue, it could and perhaps already has forever changed my son's perspective and appreciation for school and education, which ultimately could forever ruin his long-term educational experience. But educational struggles are not all that I witness. I see signs of separation anxiety and symptoms of social anxiety. All of these things never existed before at before at home learning and are of course due to lack of socialization. At this point with half a school year behind us, I am exhausted and clearly frustrated. I see firsthand what schools look like when they're open 100% of the time. Our family cannot continue with hybrid learning if that is the path U City takes. Could you please take some time to help me understand the questions below? One, you say you will reopen completely when it is safe. What really does that mean? Two, you said we were a part of a six week gradual reopening. Six weeks have passed and nothing has changed. Please help me understand what you meant by six week gradual reopening. Three, what COVID information have you gathered since the time of reopening? Has it proven to be safe as you were expecting? If so, why are we not pushing forward? Help me understand why we are not making this happen for our families that are ready and willing to move forward with in-person learning. What is holding up? What is the holdup? We desperately want to stay with the district. We love our school and the teachers, but we cannot do this any longer and we cannot waste any more time. Please feel free to contact me. And the next comment is also regarding the same topic, in-person classes, and it's uh, was sent in by Lisa Harris. To the members of the U City School Board and Dr. Harden Bartley, I'm writing as a concerned parent and a pediatrician. My goal in writing this letter is to encourage the school board to work toward opening schools for full in-person school as soon as possible. I am a community pediatrician affiliated with Washington University and I have been very active in the local school reopening process. I am part of the St. Louis Pandemic Task Force School Reopening Subcommittee as well as part of the local pediatric COVID-19 learning consortium. consortium. Based on medical data, some even collected locally, it is very possible to have schools open now despite high levels of COVID in the community. Study after study is showing that schools are mas with masking and mitigation strategies in place are safe, especially for the youngest students. The Harvard School of Public Health recently updated its recommendations for in-person school saying, we can now recommend that schools be open even at the very high levels of spread we are now seeing, provided they are strictly implementing strategies of infection control. I'm extremely concerned about the burden of school closure on all children, but especially on low-income and black students. I literally spend all day at work talking with kids and their families about the health and social struggles they are having right now. I can tell you, I am continually seeing kids from all backgrounds with excessive weight gain, mental health struggles, no opportunities for physical activity, a familial stress that is putting them, in very, at, putting them very much at risk for long-term health and educational consequences. 
Older kids are disengaged from virtual school and then spending any time they aren't on screens for school playing video games or looking at their phones. I have many patients who already struggle in normal school completely failing now because virtual school is not an adequate substitute. These are effects that will play out in the health of our children over the coming years, in addition to the widening education gap. Secondly, secondary efforts of school closures are my biggest health concern for kids right now. Our school system has done a great job implementing masking and mitigation strategies. It is time to move beyond the hybrid model, which increases everyone's potential exposure with a three days out of school and move to in-person school five days per week. Balancing the effects of COVID-19 on our community with the effects of school closure is a huge challenge, but all families should be given the opportunity to send their kids to school, as well as have the option to remain in virtual school if that is the right choice for their family. Although there is hope that the vaccine will change things, that change is going to be a long process and our kids cannot bear the burden of ongoing school closure any longer. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to provide a list of references from the medical literature for everyone who would like to read further. Thank you. That concludes citizen comments. Thank you, Julie. Uh, now we will go into um, executive session. Thank you everyone who tuned in tonight. Um, can I get a motion to go in to executive session for January 7th, uh, 2021 for personnel, real estate and superintendent evaluation? Motion by Suda. Second, Bellows. Um, okay. Uh, so we'll vote. Joanne? Aye. Tracy? Aye. George? Are you unmuting, George? Aye. Tracy? Aye. Laverne? Aye. Matt? Aye. Lisa? I think that was an aye. Aye. <laughs> okay, thank you. Aye. Thanks again, everyone who uh, tuned in tonight. Have a great weekend. And I'll see you guys in about three oh, minutes. Uh, Chris, are we using the same link? No, Julie, can you send us um, the link?